This morning comes from one of Paul's letters that he was writing to the church in Corinth, a reading from 2 Corinthians. I want you to know, Corinthians, about the grace of God that has been granted to the churches over in Macedonia. And I want you to know their story because during a time of severe trial and tribulation, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty overflowed in a wealth of generosity. For as I can testify, they voluntarily gave according to their means and even beyond their means. And they asked us earnestly for the gift of partnering in this ministry to the saints. And not as we expected, instead they gave themselves first to the Lord and by the will of God to us, so that we might urge our friend and colleague Titus that as he had started, so he should also work with you to complete this generosity or this grace giving. Now, as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all eagerness, and in our love for you. So we also want you to excel in generosity. I do not say this as a command, but by bringing up the eagerness of others, I am testing the genuineness of your love. For you know the grace giving of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Now, I am giving my opinion. It is good for you, who just began last year, not only to do something, but even to want to do something. So finish doing it, in order that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, then the gift is acceptable, according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. For I don't mean there should be relief for others, but hardship for you. It's a question of equality between your abundance today and their need, so that their abundance might meet your need in order that there may be equality. As it is written in the Exodus story, the one who had much manna did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Think of a potluck. Think of an ideal potluck where everything was brought by someone who made it with love. Think of an ideal potluck with the perfect main course. It might be a casserole, might be lasagna, might be something else. Maybe there are some soups, like Merla's soup from Girl Scouts. Or maybe the soup is whatever soup won the Lenten soup bracket of your own heart. Maybe there's some jello salads, maybe some sort of punch, some great desserts. At this potluck, everyone brings as much as they can. Or you might bring a little bit less if you don't have as much. But either way, everyone brings enough and everyone gets fed. It's a good idea, right? It's harder to make those kinds of potlucks actually happen. There's all kinds of questions that come up. How can we make sure there's enough food? How can we make sure that everyone who needs food can get it? How can we make sure that people don't take more than they need? How can we make sure that the people with the most give fully of what they are able? How do we make this idea a reality? The ideal hoped for potluck against the potluck as it is, or as Paul is alluding to in this letter, he dreams of an ideal world that strains against the world as it is. In the world as it is, 
There are some who have more, and there are some who have less. Paul addresses this by challenging the Corinthians to generosity. Every Sunday, we talk about generosity and notice it in our lives. Pastor Trudy starts every service noticing generosity in the life of the congregation and invites you to think of all the different ways that you were generous this week or that you saw generosity this week, and it doesn't have to be money or resources. It can be time. It can be talent. It can be kind words or patience or love. Generosity is grace, taking all different kinds of forms. And by starting each service naming generosity, this church names its central mission to be generous is GLC's dream. We name it and we claim it. Additionally, in our reading today, Paul names and claims another, equality as a Christian value. He says it is a question of equality between your abundance and their need, so that their abundance might someday meet your need. Generosity is Paul's way to get to equality. After trying to inspire the Corinthians with the story of the Macedonians who gave abundantly even though they were in the time of trial and tribulation, Paul encourages generosity, or grace, explaining that we give out of a place of faith. And our giving makes a more equal world, which means for us that a core value of our faith is equality. This value of equality stood against the status quo of the ancient world. One modern scholar gives a helpful frame of reference to understand the economic situation of many people at that time. He says, the vast majority of the population in Paul's day were desperately poor, living near or at sustenance level, with a few people living at a level that we would today call middle class, merchants and small businessmen and so on, and even fewer wealthy elites. And the scholar goes on and says that the Jewish tradition that Paul and the early church came out of was not economically neutral. There was found within it an ideal of abundance for everyone, a shared prosperity and primary attention given to the poor. Where is the scholar getting this idea from? Well, we see it in the Torah, in the first five books of the Bible, in the gleaning laws, and in the sabbatical and jubilee laws, in anti-usury laws, and then in constant reminders to put the interests of the poor first. Not to mention then the prophetic tradition, all the prophets who constantly spoke on behalf of the poor. All of these are central to our faith. And here's Paul who sees some churches that are poor and struggling and need help. So he goes and gathers resources from the communities he has relationship with, like the Corinthians, for example. And by bringing the Macedonians into the picture, Paul is connecting these two different churches who may otherwise never know each other. And Paul invites them into a common sharing of the church universal. We can think of this common sharing by putting those words together and saying commoning. When we common, we pool resources together in order that those with the most might share with those with the least. Think of a potluck, for example, where everyone brings what they can so that everyone's need can be met. Just like in the Exodus story where everyone was given the exact amount of manna that they need for the day. But commoning is an ideal. The challenge is relationship, which is hard enough on its own, but relationship with people far away, and who knows, maybe the Corinthians don't even want to be connected to the Macedonians or any other church at all. 
When we common our resources, we give up that individual richness in exchange for a different kind of richness. It might not look like the richness of the world as it is that tells us that we should amass wealth for ourselves, that we should turn a profit and always make common sense financial decisions. The world as it is so often values profit over people. Instead, with the ideal of equality and sharing resources generously, we experience the richness of a different sort of relationships, which are both blessings and challenges. And in those relationships, we give and receive grace. Relationships with grace bind us together so that we are not alone. So to sum it all up, Paul names generosity. He dreams that the Corinthians will join the church's commoning of resources that, by the way, began back in the book of Acts chapter 2. And Paul names equality, this value that comes from our faith, the Exodus story. Generosity is Paul's dream for the church, and equality is the core value of faith that guides it. Yesterday, I went to an event held by the People's Lobby in Chicago, which is a community organization that strives to improve the lives of working class people in the state of Illinois. The People's Lobby has a lot of connections to people of faith, and many leaders in the organization are pastors. Some are even ELCA pastors. And the work they do connects Christian values like these to political actions and movements that are going on at the state and local levels. State and local levels. It's so easy to feel unmoored by the national political conversation. There's a lot of fear on every side, and there's not much that seems to be hopeful for. We're more animated by anger and resentment than by hope. But the folks at the People's Lobby don't talk about national politics. We talked about local and state level things and we celebrated lots of big and little wins across plenty of areas where we see hope and change. Some of the conversations at this meeting actually talked about exactly what Paul is writing about too. We did an activity sort of like musical chairs, where 15 volunteers were gathered from uh, those of us who were attending the meeting. Someone, everyone had their own seat, and then someone who pretended to be Elon Musk or insert any other mega billionaire took several chairs for himself. And then 14 people were left to fight over five chairs, even though there were initially enough chairs for everyone. The chairs represented the resources that a person needs to live a dignified life. We have all we need, but then when those chairs or resources are hoarded, when generosity does not flow, when there is no relationship between the people with much and the people with little, we fight and we wound and we despair. What if we leaned on our faith values to dream of a better world, a world of generosity, of equality, of growing relationships, of resources shared? That world is an ideal, but it's an ideal grounded in our faith. Again, the Jewish tradition that Paul and the early church came out of was not economically neutral. There was found within it an ideal of abundance for everyone, a shared prosperity and primary attention given to the poor. All of these are central to our faith, and they give us hope for an ideal world. We can't let go of that hope, a world where all can live a dignified life, the hoped-for potluck is out there, and the specifics depend on what our values are. So, I invite you to reflect. 
on this place? What are our values? Generosity? Yes. How about equality? Welcome, inclusion, an open space. Love, compassion, leadership, healing. We practice the world that we hope for. May the ideal that seems far off be brought closer by the relationships we forge close to home, by our connections sustained far away. And may the whole church sustain and uplift through Jesus Christ, now and forevermore. Amen.